I want to share something with you. This message is not a sermon. It's not something you're going to find in a theology book. It's a testimony. It's a testimony on something that God has done inside of my life this week, and, and he challenged me in a way that I'd never looked at this before. And I really was considering it, it was a lesson for me. And I had taken that lesson, and I was trying to implement it. And of course, early in the week, I was working on the message I was preparing for today, and I really felt like I was trying to stick a square peg in a round hole. It just wasn't happening. And I walked away from the computer in, in, in my study, and I just said, okay, God, what is it? And he continued flooding my heart with this lesson in which he started teaching me. And I said, okay, Lord. I said, I don't know how it's going to go, but we'll do it. And I don't know about you, but for the ones of you that are here that are believers, and you have read God's Word, and you have been taught God's Word, there are probably some scriptures that occasionally come to your mind. And, and at times when they come to your mind, you kind of think on them, and you, you think that that's something good, that's something great that, that needs to happen in my life. Well, I don't know about you, but sometimes when that starts happening with me, I start thinking about this scripture and then this scripture, and I try to figure out how to make those two scriptures come together. And then if you're here this morning and you're like, Wes, I don't know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with him. Well, I hope you can stay with me and stay to the end with this testimony. One of the things in which was flooding my heart was the Great Commission. God has called us to make disciples. And one of the things that happens to his people is we lose love for him. We lose that first love. It becomes numb. It becomes monotonous. It becomes flippant. And, and that love that we have for him it, it just kind of fades away because it, it doesn't continue to grow. Well, I hope to challenge you with that this morning. And as I was telling you how I like to try to combine scriptures, the first thing that was coming to my mind was there, the Great Commission. But then the second thing that came to my mind was in Jeremiah chapter 18. And I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles there. For some reason, my earpiece is really messing up this morning. I'm sorry. The title of this message is Working at the Wheel, Jeremiah 18. Now, I have heard this message preached in so many ways. I've heard it talked about the clay. I've heard it talked about the potter. I've even seen people bring people that does pottery up on stage while the preachers preach. And that's all great. And that's all biblical. And that's what this passage is about. But there's something that God taught me when I was thinking about these two passages. About this passage dealing with clay and then dealing with the passage of the Great Commission. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1, it says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at the wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands. He reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done? Declares the Lord, behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not there trying to take this out of any context, trying to add to the Scripture or take away from the Scripture. This passage is talking about clay. It is talking about how God is the potter. And it is talking about how you and I, we are the clay. And we are to be in the potter's hands 
to be molded and shaped. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. No other way. I want that up front and understood. But as I was trying to explain to you, I try to connect these two passages. And all of a sudden, I want you to back up and look at verse 3. I want you to look there at verse 3. It says there in verse 3, he says, So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. I never had noticed this before. I've never heard anyone teach or preach about the wheel. And I was trying to ask God to explain to me and teach me something. How does this wheel line up? Now, he has called his believers, the ones in whom put their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, to be disciple makers. Yes or no? Yes. Are we doing that? That's up to you. But here's the thing. The only way a potter is to make his pottery, he has to have the wheel, and the wheel has to be turning. Do you realize that for us, yes, we are to, the, to be the clay, and every day to allow God to be molding and shaping us into his image. Don't get me wrong. But for us as disciples, we are to reach out to others. You know what? I can't save no one, nor can you. Jesus can, a.k.a. the potter. He can save. I can't. You and I have a responsibility to go into the world and, and to bring these people unto the Father and say, Lord, here they are, and let him do this. One of the things in which stirred this inside of me and started happening, there was this guy that was a part of my life for a season a long time ago. He sent me some emails, and, and he's getting ready to do some missions. And he was think, thanking me for some of the things that God had done in his life. And I was sitting there thinking, dude, I, I didn't do nothing. That was all God. And, and as he was talking to me about that, I was like, God just allowed me to be there and watch God work in him. And all of a sudden, that's when these two passages started knitting together. You see, us as believers and disciples in Christ, we have to become that wheel. And we bring the clay to the Father. And, and, and the clay is set on the wheel. And, and I've been doing some studying about how this works, and I want you to think about this, and I want you to see how this happens. Now, one of the ways how the best way I've ever been able to explain the Trinity or to understand it for myself is use the description of H2O. The chemical makeup of H2O is water. Water comes in a liquid form, it comes in a solid form, and it comes in a steam form. All three of them are H2O, just as the Trinity, God, the Father, and the Son, the Holy Ghost. There's still one. And we have to understand that he is the one in which does the work. Without the potter, there would be no product. Without God touching and working in the hearts of the lives of people, no one's life would be changed. I don't care how good you are or what you try to do, you cannot change a person's heart. Only God can. I can't tell you how many times my grandparents and parents and, and people in my life beat me to try to act right and do right. And you know what? I didn't do it. But when God got a hold of my heart, things changed. Priorities changed. Directions changed in my life. I don't care how hard you beat the child. You're not going to change the child's heart. But God can. You can't change an old person's heart. But God can. And what we have to realize is he is the potter and he wants to put his hands upon the clay. And he wants to shape the clay how he wants. But when we notice this, this wheel, the potter is the one that gives the wheel power. Now, back in the day, the, the wheel was kind of pedaled by the guy's foot. You can do some research, and there were some stones that, that the wheel at the top was real small, and the one at the bottom was real big, and the guy would move his foot, and the rotation would be smaller for the big wheel, but because it was so big, it made the top wheel spin so much faster. 
And, and, and the potter could sit there with his foot like this and kick the wheel, and, and that's how he operated it. As time went, they became more electronic, more different powers. And, but the only way the wheel would take off and have any motion is when the potter was ready to do the work. The potter would activate the wheel in however that wheel was to go in motion. And you and I have to understand that we have to be willing to allow God to put us into motion. I want you to think about someone that's in your life that doesn't know Jesus. I want you to think about them. You say, well, yes, I, and you might be here and say, well, yes, I really don't know. Well, let me tell you something. There's probably some people right up and down this road, right out here. You ain't got to go very far. How can God allow you to become the wheel in their life? How can God use you to allow them to become that clay on top of your wheel and you become beneath the potter's hands, turning and allowing God, the potter, to shape and mold their clay? Now, you have to realize that me and you, as the wheel, the wheel is always being affected by the potter. There's mud that comes off the clay. There's water that comes off the clay. There's wear and tear that happens to the wheel. But it is done in such a way that the wheel and the potter become one. You and I, as believers, we have to become one in the Father. Now, I don't know about how many of you know about some of the things about clay, but when you take the clay and it is real sticky and slimy and you put it on the wheel, it slides right off. And they tell you, you can't use no slimy clay. It can't be dry either. It has to be damp. And when you take that damp clay and you put it on the wheel, they say, you put it in the very center, and you hit it twice. Not once, not three times, but only twice. And you say, why only twice? Well, here's what happens. The moisture allows a suction to happen between the clay and the wheel that the clay won't move. The first pop allows that suction to happen. The second pop that you put on the clay allows it to have the form in which it needs. Multiple hits allows the, the clay to come out of shape and become lopsided. Not, a, not just one hit doesn't allow the clay to have the proper shape for when the wheel starts turning. You may be thinking, now what does this have to do with me? Here's what it has to do with all of us. You and I have to be living Christ in people's lives. We can't talk it and not walk it. We can't proclaim it and not live it. Because, see, when we talk it and we walk it and we proclaim it and we live it, you're slapping the clay. You, you, you're popping those that are lost, that don't know Christ, or even sometimes you're popping some of the believers. And you're becoming like their wheel, and they're becoming like the clay, and God is using you like the wheel to turn the clay that the potter is able to work in their lives. Here's the thing. The potter has to put the pressure on the wheel to start the process. There's a process in making pottery. Once he slaps that clay on there and it makes that suction and it starts turning, he grabs a hold of the clay and he has to put pressure upon the clay, but the pressure is really put upon the wheel. He said, Wes, all right, here it goes for you and me. You see, when we start talking it and we start walking it, the lost is watching you even harder. The pressure is put upon you not to be a hypocrite. The pressure is put upon you that you live it in such a way that they look at you and at your life and they say, I want what you have. 
And when they come to that mindset of saying, I see something different in you because of that pressure that is being put upon you, the wheel's turning. The potter is reaching his hand in there, and he's shaping and molding it. Here's the thing. God challenged me, and he said, Wes, he says, I know you love me. I said, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, Wes, he said, turn your wheel. He said, I need you to be turning. And I was like, Lord, I'm trying to turn. And here's the thing that as I was praying about this part of the turning of the wheel, I said, Lord, where do we mess up with our turning?" And here's what was pressed upon my heart. Many times, we stop a little short when the potter's not through with the vessel. And guess what happens? If he's working upon that vessel, and the potter's working on it, and all of a sudden, the wheel stops, his progress, the process collapses, and it's no good. If the wheel turns too long or too fast and the potter is ready to take the vessel off the wheel, but because it's turning, he can't get it off, it's ruined too. Here's the thing, and here's where this lines up with you and me. That's when you and I take things in our own hands. When we put it upon our timetable, our ability, and our strength. But when you and I allow the potter to put the power in us to influence those around us, a.k.a. the wheel, he'll show us and give us the power to keep going or it's time to stop and let me get the vessel off the wheel. Question. How you doing with that? What kind of vessels are on your wheel right now? What kind of vessels are you allowing God to put on your wheel that he's using you to use his hands to shape others' lives around you? Is he at your table right now and you're spinning and does he have multiple vessels on your table at a time? Are you saying, Wes, my table ain't been turned on in quite a while. I don't know at what stage you're at. Sometimes you may be at the table and it's spinning, but there's no clay on top of it. What good is that? You say, Wes, where, where do you get this? Well, when you look there in verse 3, the Lord, in verse 1 and 2, he had sent him to go to the potter's house. And before anything took place in this process, before he was able to start showing the illustration that you and I are the clay and he is the potter, the wheel was introduced into the process. It says the potter was at his wheel. Here's the thing. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are to be disciple makers, a.k.a. we are to be the wheel that pottery is made upon. I can't make you be a wheel I can't make you be a wheel in which is turning. But here's the thing. If you sincerely love God and you sincerely want to commit your life to God, He can do it. If you're willing to say, God, here I am. Make me be a wheel. Put the clay on me. Apply the pressure to make the vessel. And however you decide to make it, here I am, turn me. You see, we got too many Christians that's, that's a little inconvenience. It's going to take away from my personal time, my personal want. You realize that the potter controls the wheel? The wheel doesn't say, well, I don't feel like making no pottery today. Or I'm a little tired today. Or I, I need a little cleaning. No. When the potter walks in and he sits down in his wheel and he slaps that clay on top of it and he makes that suction for the clay to stay on top of the wheel, the work begins. 
You and I, it's not about our time. It's not about what we want. It's about are we allowing ourselves to be available to be the wheel for the Father. I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. But I think there's too few Christians that's not willing to allow the potter to turn the wheel. I know for me, personally, God challenged me this week and I'm trying my best to turn my wheel. And I'm trying my best to be available for him to slap whatever clay he wants on me. What about you? Let's pray. Father,